When you think about what it takes to make a great school, or a nation of great schools, there are many questions that need to be answered. I've been asking some of my friends the answers to these questions. They're a little bit older now. The debate is raging. What direction will this nation take our schools? Should we privatize our public schools? Should we fire all the teachers in our underperforming schools? What do we do about unequal resources? Teachers are talking. Is the nation listening? Every day in the media, on TV, radio, in the newspaper, we hear from the administrators, politicians, think tankers, and the businesses. This movie is about hearing from those who don't usually get heard. There's a very dangerous disconnect going on in American education. We live in a time of national madness. Teachers aren't deciding the curriculum. Some big shot sitting somewhere else are deciding what needs to be taught, and they're doing it basically on the basis of selling more stuff. It, it can't be in the hands of people who have never taught a day in their lives. I've worked for the BPS for 15 years, and for 15 years there have been cuts after cuts after cuts. That we don't have any resources. We have textbooks that are falling apart. Social studies, science, art, music, um, phys ed, recess. Uh, you know, it narrows the educational opportunities that kids get, especially poor kids or kids that go to school districts that have fewer resources. Wealthy school systems will implement them, and then poorer kids and poorer systems will say, gee, we really believe that, but we have to get our kids through this testing regime and that testing regime. I feel like teachers are, are definitely being used to promote this idea that data is the best thing in the world, that this is the, the genuine proof that the students are succeeding. When it's not, I think it's just a sham. Data can really be manipulative. So you have to ask yourself, who's this data speaking to and for? And so if policymakers only look at certain data, you're right, they're always going to think something's not as good as it could be. There's nothing about mischief in No Child Left Behind. Nothing about joy either. Nothing about compassion. What happened during the last 10 years under NCLB is instead of expanding the richness of the curriculum and the richness of the education they could get, that's been contracting. A lot of the experiential learning has dropped out of the curriculum. It's very difficult to fit creativity into a curriculum that is dictated to you, into a curriculum that mandates you teach certain skills so that kids are able to pass a certain test. And they loathe it. They hate it. They hate the pressure. They hate, they hate the constant testing. They, they can't stand it anymore. And school should be fun. Kids love to explore. They love to learn new things. They love to discover things about themselves. Everyone does, but school has not become that place anymore. When you see that light in their eye, you go, oh my God, there's no amount, there's no amount of money that a teacher is paid to see that. When they see that, that's the encouragement, that's the emotional piece. Any sort of merit pay evaluation system has to take into consideration the huge diversity of the students that you're working with and, and you know, the incredible barriers and odds that the public schools are supposed to fix. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the thing. It's public schools always get blamed for not fixing society's problems. <laughs> and it's like, it's not, it's, it's not just the schools. You have to look at, do they have, ac do people have access to jobs? Is there, you know, do they have proper housing, medical care? Like there's all sorts of 
There's all sorts of things that conspire against students besides just public school education. If, if there is enormous oppression, if there is a great lack of justice in their lives, if there is not health insurance, if there is not adequate housing, if there is not criminal justice, which most of these places there aren't, if there is not a job, if there is not decent job and decent pay and all the benefits that come with all of that, uh, and housing, and the family is struggling with all these things at best, if not completely unraveling um, and self-destroying, uh, then learning becomes next to impossible. We need to do it not fighting, not dividing. We need to get into, into it together in order to solve the big problem we, we're dealing with. We need to work collaboratively with the teachers. And this is where leadership comes in very important. There is a top-down leadership, and then there is a leadership that says, this is a community. We are all professionals, and we need to work together. And I think creating that atmosphere is vital. Now, the superintendent has to be enunciating that. What I would do if I was, you know, is pair new teachers with older teachers, because there's a way of learning from each other rather than pitting them against each other. Older teachers are being uh, pushed on for uh, a variety of reasons, which could be they cost too much, they speak up when things are wrong, they speak for kids, they talk to the community, to parents, and, uh, they, and if, you're, if you're running a kind of uh, rigid bureaucracy, those aren't the best people to have. You want young people, new to the field, who are willing to do what they're told. That's where we are. The effects of NCLB, which is measure, punish, stigmatize. And on top of NCLB, we get the race to the top, which says, fire teachers, close schools. It's very uh, convenient nowadays for people to blame seniority or uh, the 20-year veteran teacher. When you don't invest in quality, oftentimes you're constantly replacing what you should have just invested in the first time. There are many charter schools that have had great press, and I was so excited to work in a school that could be considered a lab for innovation. But once I got there, I realized that the school was not as innovative as I hoped for. In charter schools, they have no unions. And uh, I was in a meeting with a director of a charter school not too long ago, and he asked me why I was against charter schools. I said, I'm not against charter schools. Uh, uh, tell me something. Uh, how many teachers, your school is five years old, how many teachers are there who in, are now in the school who were there five years ago? He said, hardly any. So they burn teachers out. They don't create a sense of community that the public schools uh, really should have and do have. And uh, I, don't, I don't think that saying unions are the problem. I think it's not having a good connection with the union, working with the teachers, and it's, uh, it, it's management uh, trying to, uh, not having the right managers in who know how to deal with that. It, it's a community effort. It's an effort between one group and another to deal with the children and make them better. And if you don't operate on a cooperative basis, you're not gonna get things done. I have watched charter schools from day one with concern. The concept sounds wonderful, and the press fell in love with them. And I might add that the charter school organizations are very well funded, and they have a, a PR budget to die for. There is a lot of money sitting in charter school bank accounts. Mm -hmm. They've been very successful financially. I just looked up a couple. Uh, Boston Collegiate Charter School has got $2.8 million in the bank. Uh, neighborhood House has $1.4 million in the bank. Boston Preparatory Charter School, $1.5 million in the bank. Uh, Cambridge Community Charter School, $1.4 million in the bank. In the bank. They are a huge disappointment. There are good charter schools. I'm not going to say there aren't good charter schools. At whose expense? They take the money away from the other kids, so they can. They take the money off the top, 
They can limit the size of their class. They can put, and, and they, we know they push out the more difficult to educate students, so they push out the behavioral problems. They pu push out the learning disabled kids. They never take the English language learners to begin with. What is most amazing is how often those push outs come before MCAS tests are given. So the kids don't have to show up on the charter school rolls and, and their MCAS scores can look much better. And they, then they're left, the kids are back in the public school and their, their MCAS scores are part of the public schools. There's, there's profit uh, to be made apparently off education. And so decisions are made that, uh, that hurt the students that I teach. If teachers and parents aren't being the most vocal, somebody else is filling in that void and somebody else is pushing the agenda. And that's what we have happening in education. The private companies, the consulting companies, the testing companies, the foundations that are paid for by those companies that do the research that justifies their private interest in the education system, their voice is very loud, their voice is very consistent, and their voice is driving this debate because we don't have the kind of organization of parents and teachers that we need to have pushing the debate in the opposite direction. It's not because uh, lawmakers are lazy, it's not because the policy is just stagnant, the policy is moving forward but in the wrong direction because the voice that's loudest is the voice that has the most conflict of interest in education and that is not the voice of the teachers and the parents. Education is the only field that I, I feel that business people, that politicians have more to say about teaching than the educators. Is you cannot balance the budget on the backs of workers. All of us that work for wages in this Commonwealth have to stand shoulder to shoulder with our teachers to make sure we have the resources to teach our kids. The message to you that you say power, students. Power. Students. Power. Students. Power. Students. Power. When I say teacher, you say power. Teacher. Power. Teacher. Power. When I say parents, you say power. Parents. Power. Parents. Power. Big chief executive offices are getting these outrageous bonuses. The gap between the rich and the poor is is greater than it's ever been in American history. You've got to stop the rhetoric that pretends that changes to schools will overcome the consequences of poverty. Improvement, yes. Solving poverty, poverty no. And that rhetoric has to stop. Why are the pressures coming down from Washington to turn our classrooms into testing factories and the pressure from the business world as well? So a lot of it's coming from the corporate arena to view our children not as children, but as so many little economic units, future deficits or assets for the corporate society. The level of engagement with children when they work in the arts is um, very high. They're always um, really happy to have art. They always want to know when they have art and they're always excited, for the most part, to, to be there and work with what I have. So um, one little boy said, um, you always have something interesting for us to do. And when I get those comments, it makes me um, really enjoy my job. and, and understand the importance of what I do. I used to work teach at English High School when it was on Louis Pasteur Avenue and we had, that was the magnet art program. We had 10 art teachers. We had Julie painting, ceramics, drawing, uh, photography, had a huge dark room. Um, and it was a wonderful place to work at as an art teacher because kids knew they could go from expertise to expertise or area to area and learn everything there was to learn and then 
we'd help them do their portfolios. And we were affiliated with Mass College of Art, so we'd have student teachers. And we were affiliated with the um, Museum of Fine Arts, so I could take them over to see, quote unquote, the masters and, you know, real artwork from ancient history, whatever. But um, that was dismantled. So, and after that, um, harder to, to find a real home and have a real classroom. So, and it seems to be at that time, that's when they decided that maybe art wasn't that important to them. So they could just keep cutting art programs and putting in two English, two English classes or two math classes or um, whatever, two science classes, whatever MCAS said they needed. Because it seems like our system is driven by MCAS, not by what the basic information of an educated person for the year 2010 should need to know. Good afternoon, my name is Janet McDermott and I'm here on behalf of my daughter Shannon. Shannon is truly a child left behind. We live in Marshfield, Massachusetts, where Shannon has attended, tw attended 12 years of the Marshfield public school system. All her time and effort for 12 years, she was never awarded her high school diploma along with her class in 2006. She was four points shy of passing the MCAS, the math MCAS section of the MCAS. She was a good student, attended school, and met all her other graduation requirements, but none of that mattered. All her hard work for 12 years was not taken into consideration, only the four points shy of the MCAS. Shannon did everything that was asked of her from the school. She took the test every time it was offered, hoping that she would pass and receive her high school diploma along with her peers. Shannon has learning disabilities. She suffers from epilepsy. This disorder to her brain prevents her from being able to comprehend some of the math material on the test. During her 12 years of school, Shannon put 100% effort into her schoolwork while taking 18 pills a day just to make it through the day and not have seizures in front of her classmates. Life has always been more of a struggle for her. She has always had to endure disappointments throughout her life. For example, not getting invited to sleepovers when she was younger and not being able to get her driver's license at 16 like her peers. But the blow that the Massachusetts Department of Education gave her by far was the most devastating to her well-being and self-esteem as this has affected the rest of her life. Instead of Shannon's graduation day being a happy celebration like it was for most of her peers, it was heart-wrenching and devastating. Unlike her peers, Shannon walked out of that ceremony with an empty diploma and left wondering why she had even bothered or tried to be a good student. Her graduation day is something that can never be given back to her. There were students who didn't even try as hard or didn't even care as much, but they were granted a diploma because they were fortunate enough to have been blessed with a healthier brain. Shannon had hopes and dreams and wanted to attend a small college in Dover, New Hampshire for photography, but with no diploma, there was no college. Over the past three years since she has left school, she has suffered from depression when all her friends went off to fulfill their dreams. Shannon has bounced around and has not been able to find her place. Shannon has been unable to move forward and become an independent, productive adult. She has had difficulty finding a job because every application asks about her high school diploma. She cannot even get into a trade school. The material on the test that Shannon couldn't comprehend is things that she would never need to know in life. What the future holds for Shannon now is she will end up on public assistance as she does not have the schooling and the skills that she needs in order to be able to provide for herself. There is something very wrong here for the state of Massachusetts to stand in the way of all of her hopes and dreams. Today, we have good evidence that high stakes tests like the MCAS do not accomplish their intended aims. Within the last year, two of the best studies on high stakes tests 
were published in scholarly journals. Both studies found no relationship between the use of these tests and high school students' academic achievement. Furthermore, both studies also found that high-stakes testing, such as the MCAS, does nothing to close the achievement gap. We also have evidence that the MCAS graduation requirement is disproportionately denying diplomas to the groups that education reform was intended to help. We have students who pass the MCAS no problem first time around and get trounced on the SAT. Um, and I think we need to shoot for higher rigor and more important, that's going to come from inside a learner. The learner has to believe there's more for me to get. Um, and I think that standardized testing does little to promote that thirst for knowledge, that hunger for more. It promotes much more this uh, stairs landing sense. You reach this landing, you're all set, you're done, stop climbing. Learning should be something um, that we teach people to do throughout a lifetime rather than just cover a curriculum in whatever subject, mine being literature, of course. I think working in the Boston Public Schools, the probably in any public school system, the largest change in my career span is unfortunately the results of No Child Left Behind. And prior to that legislation, I felt that there was a subtle shift, um, and it might have been dying down by the time I started my career, toward both teacher and student empowerment. Uh, when I came aboard, at least here at Snowden, I had a whole lot of freedom along with my students in selecting what methods we would use to attain certain skill sets of analyzing literature, of being able to compose both argumentative and expository writing, as well as finding a voice, especially for the younger students, finding their own writer's voice. Once No Child Left Behind was passed, despite all the talk of we won't teach to a test, it's not just about the test, rather quickly it's become exactly that, about almost nothing but the test and its scores. And I think the combined movements of uh, what I would call phony accountability and standardization have done a lot to damage uh, autonomy among learners, autonomy among staffs, and autonomy among teachers, which I would think have been very valuable tools for creating space for students who may be otherwise disinterested in school or may otherwise find um, school intimidating. And now the one-size-fits-all measurements um, create a one-size-fits-all style of learner that I think has been really damaging for both teachers and for students. Some of my most stressed out schools are no longer teaching history, no longer teaching science. They're only teaching the test and subjects. Now, I'm afraid of, you know, in a democracy, I'm afraid of a nation of citizens who, have no, who know nothing about their history, who know nothing about the science. On February 28, 2011, Boston teachers and staff received this email from the Boston Plan for Excellence News headlined, Schools Rally the Whole Community with Data. We're pleased to share the latest issue of our Focus newsletter, which highlights four schools that are using data to rally students, families, and faculty to meet student learning goals. I clicked on the Data-Driven Inquiry link. Data-driven inquiry helps teachers and school leaders invest energy where it has the greatest impact. By keeping everyone's attention on student performance data, inquiry fosters a culture of public practice and shared responsibility for student success. On May 12, 2011, teachers and staff also received the monthly staff newsletter from Boston Superintendent Johnson, headlined, To Expand Quality, We Must Define and Measure It. The newsletter states that, on May 11th, Chief Accountability Officer Frank Barnes presented to the school committee an outline of our new school support and accountability framework. The framework will help us identify the opportunity gaps and supports needed to accelerate performance. It is aligned to the acceleration agenda and strengthens our efforts to establish a data-driven system of evaluating school quality. The schools are operating under um, a model of performance and achievement which does not begin with learners. It, it's a transmission model where the students are supposed to do X and Y as evidenced by high stakes testing. And therefore the teacher must uh, have students perform to a certain level, which is called achievement. The, most people know, I shouldn't say most, I don't know who knows, but what I feel is that those who get the best education recognize that's a minimalist education. That's not something 
that one aspires to. One is given this intellect that one wants to grow. In the same way one is an artist, no one would settle for a minimum artistic musical performance just and then applaud them because they could play chords. Uh, they want to play music, rich music. The current environment does not uh, allow for and, and encourage this rich view of what it means to be a thoughtful, educated person. As I look at my life today, uh, the things that I value the most about myself, my imagination, my love of acting, my passion for writing, my love of learning, my curiosity, all of these things came from the way that I was parented and taught. And none of these qualities that I just mentioned, none of these qualities that I prize so deeply, none of these qualities that have brought me so much joy, that have made me so successful, professionally even, none of these qualities that make me who I am can be tested. The emphasis is on conformity uh, rather than growth. Uh, and it's very sad because teaching is a craft or a vocation or a profession. And what one wants to get better at it, one, was, one does not want to have one's craft constrained and limited by other people as if I could not be able to perform it myself. Hello, I am a consultant. I am going to decide whether you are a good teacher. Would you like to observe my class? No, I am busy. I can tell from test scores. How can you do that? I am data driven. I will take your students scores. I will put them into my regression equation, predict your growth scores based on demographic data, subtract your actual scores, and find out whether you are a good teacher. This is the latest science. But my students are all different. Some are shy, some act crazy, some are excited about learning. How can you predict their scores? I know their race and I know whether they get free lunch. That is enough. Some only speak a little English. Some have strong support at home. Some are on drugs. Some make beautiful paintings. Each one is different. Why don't you come watch me teach them? I am data driven. I will watch your test scores. This year I volunteer to take the three hardest students in the school. They don't do well on tests. That is an excuse. No excuses. One of my students just moved here. He does not know some things that other students know. But he can tell wonderful stories about the country where he grew up. I want to help him write those stories. That will help him learn English. He will find out he can be a good student. Watch me teach him. I don't have time. I am data driven. But education researchers say your equations cannot tell whether I am a good teacher. That is an excuse. No excuses. The researchers say your equations produce impossible results. Your equations show that a student can get good scores because of a teacher he is going to have next year, even though he has never met that teacher. There are some strange findings. But we must do something. It's for the children. The scientists say you may give me very different ratings each year. That is true. The rating I give you will probably be wrong. But it is the best we can do. No. It is not the best you can do. Come watch me teach. I will rate you using your standardized reading scores. But I teach social studies, not reading. No excuses. I recently became aware of data walls being used in schools and one that I heard about was a representation of a mountain in a school and on this mountain that maybe was made by kids, I'm not sure, maybe by adults, but there were names of children. It was called the MCAS mountain. Names of children placed on the mountain based on how they performed on the MCAS. And this is out in public view. So the children who are proficient or advanced on the MCAS are at the top of the mountain already. Children who are not or failing are at the bottom, which I find
kind of appalling to have that information public. And then I googled data walls and found that there are schools in our country where teachers are required to have data walls in their classrooms where they actually um, have like a green, yellow, and red uh, depiction of you're doing well and you're not so good and you really stink. And they actually are, are uh, in classrooms for children to see, and their names are on clothespins, so they can move from the bottom loser category up to your okay category. But this is public, publicly displayed um, representation of data, which I just think is harmful. I think it destroys their self-esteem. It's also not fair to compare kids on that level. I'm sure the kids who are at the bottom, maybe of a, a testing situation, maybe they're great artists or great musicians or caring souls or um, hard workers. And maybe the ones at the top just happen to have been born into families that have opportunity. And actually on one of the sites, one of the principals said, oh, I know this works because I hear children outside saying, I, I see, I, there I am on the data wall and, and I know I'm going to do better next time and I'm going to move up, but I don't know, I, I just hope I never have to teach in a school where I'm asked to do that because I think I'd have to leave. I would have, I couldn't do it. I would refuse. It hurts kids. That's what I think it does. I just want to make one quick point because the evaluating teachers important role of value added education this is a study that uh, Richard was saying there were no studies but this is a study that was conducted by the Brookings Brown Center Task Force on Teacher Quality now for those of you who don't know the Brookings Institute is by far one of the most progressive and liberal uh, think tanks it's not one of the conservative groups that really want to rely solely on teacher performance and here's what they say we do not uh, advocate using value-added measures alone. But surely, value-added information ought to be in the mix, given the empirical evidence that it predicts more about what students will learn from the teachers to which they are assigned than any other source of information available to date. So again, we have never suggested that student test scores be the only measure. We believe that we want to look at a collective team effort at the school. We want to see how the school is doing overall, and we're putting together something that's called a school performance index, where we can list the many different things that would have to, you'd have to know about a school to know if it was going to be effective. Not just test scores, not just, um, you know, things that, not even just attendance, but a combination of things that are truly going to help us decide what has value. So I don't, I hope people hear that I do not believe that a value-added measure is the only measure, we believe that we should look at a number of indicators to determine whether school is working effectively and whether uh, we're seeing results as a team across multiple teachers. Thank you. Um, I'd like to also give um, Dr. S uh, Richard Stuntman, if you would like an opportunity. We have about a minute for um, a response. I'm just going to quote one sentence from the report. It's, it's very easy to hear because it makes a lot of sense. Teacher evaluations based on observed state test outcomes are only slightly better than coin tosses at identifying teachers whose students perform unusually well or badly in assessments of conceptual understanding. In other words, if the test is a good test that measures high level thinking like conceptual understanding, not an MCAS which measures just rote knowledge, you might as well flip a coin. Thank you. There's a basic distrust of teachers. So if you wanted to ascribe why there's an achievement problem, unfortunately, the, those who were blamed were teachers, teacher unions, uh, who were conceived as blocking the achievement of students, urban students, students of color. Uh, so, and this seems to fit in with an agenda of privatization uh, about uh, the craft of teaching. Teaching is not seen, and currently, is not seen as a, a profession where people 
are decision makers and they're entitled to be decision makers for their students. When someone tells you you're going to teach um, fractions to third graders and they hand you a book and you open the book and you realize that there's not enough practice, there's no manipulatives, there's, it's a canned product, and if you don't do this on Monday, page on Monday, and this page on Tuesday, and this page on Wednesday, and this page on Thursday, and then test it on Friday, you're going to get a, a bad evaluation. And teachers can't own that kind of teaching. It's, th it's set up for them not to be successful, not to um, not to have the tools they need to do what it is they've been asked to do. More and more money became invested in testing and in teacher, what I would call teacher conformity, rather than teacher growth. There isn't a lobby for teachers getting better. There's, always, there's a lobby for preventing teachers from supposedly doing harm. To whom it may concern, I am a student at Carpley Square High School. I am writing a letter of recommendation of one of the finest teachers I have ever known, Steve Gordon. During my sophomore and junior years, I had the chance to be taught by a great, great teacher. Mr. Gordon made English writing skills a great experience. He made class fun, interesting, and at times exciting. His intense desire to teach and see students learn is easily noticed. His students, including myself, really put an all-out effort because of his inspiration. I think more students should get a chance to experience Mr. Gordon's methods. He has really touched and inspired me, and I thank him. Sincerely, Donald Wahlberg, Copley Square High. I think our policies are misguided at this point, and we really need to take a very close look at that. And I think we need to have people who are knowledgeable and skilled in that area to sit at the table with these people who think they know it all, the business communities. You know, they think they know all about education. I'm sure no one would let me sit at a table full of doctors or lawyers and tell them how to do their profession, how to do their job, because that's not my skill set. And this certainly isn't theirs. We welcome the, su the support and the interest, but they need to be very serious about are they making the right decisions and forcing school districts into certain policies and, and initiatives that are not proven. In fact, they prove that they're increasing the dropout rate and they're lengthening the gap that exists now between children of color and white children that exists between the rich and the poor. I mean, we really need to take a look at what we are doing to the children in this country. We have come here to neither praise Arnie Duncan nor to bury him. We have come not to question his honor, but to question his being honored. Be being honored by that time-honored institution across the street. We are told by the Harvard Alumni Association that Arnie Duncan is deserving of honor, but since they, his classmates from the class of 86 who elected him chief marshal, have themselves successfully raced to the top, they have an understandable interest in honoring Arnie Duncan, one of their own. I don't know how we got to a place where the people who design and mandate education policy are not educators. They don't know children. They don't understand learning. They, they come out of the business world, but they don't know what education is. And they're imposing mandates on it that are completely out of line with what is needed for children and for teachers to be able to do what they do well. Arnie, get out of our lives, get out of education. Get out of our lives and get out of education. Harvard, shame on you for honoring this man. Were you ever a teacher, Arnie Duncan, ever? What do you know about teaching? Welcome. 
over the weekend, uh, I picked, a, I, I read the internet all the time, and I noticed that in Newsweek magazine, there's an article by Jonathan Alter, in which um, Bill Gates said, or Jonathan Alter said about Bill Gates, that I was his chief adversary. Now, Bill Gates is worth, I don't know, 30 billion, 40 billion, 50 billion. He has a really large staff. I don't have a staff. I don't have any staff. I don't even have a secretary. It's just me. And here is this big guy afraid of me. How big is, how, how exciting is that? How much fun is it? So, so in the column, he expressed, I thought it was wonderful, he expressed, expressed some questions that he would like me to answer. And on, on uh, Monday it was, I think it was Monday, this appeared in Valerie Strauss's column in the Washington Post. Valerie Strauss is the most wonderful education journalist in the United States. And she has this blog that she runs every day, The Answer Sheet. And so she invited me to respond to Bill Gates' questions. So in case some of you didn't read it, I'd like to tell you what I said. The first question he asked was, does she like the status quo? And I responded, no, I certainly don't like the status quo. I don't like the attacks on teachers. I don't like the attacks on the educators who work in our schools day in and day out. I don't like the phony solutions that are now put forward that won't improve our schools at all. I'm not at all content with the quality of American education in general, and I've expressed my criticisms over many years, long before Bill Gates decided to make education his project. I think that American children need not only testing and basic skills, but an education that includes the arts, literature, the sciences, history, geography, civics, foreign languages, economics, and physical education. I don't hear any of the corporate reformers expressing concern about the way standardized testing narrows the curriculum, the way it rewards convergent thinking and punishes divergent thinking, the way it stamps out creativity and originality. I don't hear any of them worried that a generation will grow up ignorant of history and the workings of our government. I don't hear any of them putting up $100 million to make sure that every child has the chance to learn to play a musical instrument. All I hear from them is a demand for higher test scores and a demand to tie teachers' evaluations to test scores. That's not going to improve education. So his second question was, is she sticking up for decline? <laughs> and my response was, of course not. If we follow Bill Gates' demand to judge teachers by test scores, we'll see stagnation, and he'll blame it on teachers. We'll see stagnation because a relentless focus on test scores and reading and math will inevitably narrow the curriculum only to what is tested, and this is not good education. Last week, he said in a speech that teachers should not be paid more for experience and for graduate degrees. I wonder why a man of his vast wealth spends so much time trying to figure out how to cut teachers' pay. <laughs> Does he truly believe that our nation's schools will get better if we have teachers with less education and less experience? <laughs> Who does he listen to? He needs to get himself a smarter set of advisors. It's the inequities that are built into our system. It's looking at our course offerings. It's looking at the way in which we teach. It's looking at rigorous curriculum. Are all children receiving that? Or is it basically the children who are in schools that are for wealthier children who come with certain experiences that poor children do not come with? So they're not starting out on an equal playing field. It's looking at that. It's looking at what are the support systems that's needed. It's looking at why do some schools offer foreign language? Why do some schools have laboratories? Why do some schools have electives that can... Um, get children even more involved and more motivated and other children have two block periods of reading, two block periods of math and they have nothing else. Where are the arts? Where's the theater? Where are the cultural kinds of things that tend to motivate children and make them want to be in school?
I do think the problem overall it isn't limited to Boston, and it's not limited to Massachusetts. It's the way our schools are funded. They're funded on a property tax. And whether people have schools or not, it's funded on a property tax. It's not an income tax. It's unfair. And what else is unfair is that we have such a large percentage of tax exempt property in Massachusetts, and in particular in Boston, so that the large nonprofits often get away scot-free, so that Northeastern pays $32,000 a year in property tax, and you could probably pick five people in the room here who have houses. They pay more than Northeastern. The problem with our schools is a lack of funding in addition to other issues that we can resolve by talking. But on the lack of funding, the solution isn't to go to Bill Gates and say, Bill, give me a million dollars, or Mr. Broad, give me $3 million. That's a short-term solution that doesn't help the children in Boston. It doesn't help our schools. We need to reform the tax structure, and that means being stronger and going after the Northeasterns of the world, the Mass Generals of the world, and Harvard. For example, there's no reason why Harvard should not have to pay an excise tax on the automobiles that its employees use in the city of Boston. The people's balance sheet. Corporations are making record profits, oil companies are making record profits, gas prices are skyrocketing, Congress passed billions in tax cuts for the millionaires and billionaires, Congress passed a $700 billion bailout for Wall Street, not Education Street, the world's 1,200 billionaires are doing pretty good, the defense budget is in the stratosphere, Teachers all over the country are being laid off. Public workers are being laid off. Everyone else is being laid off. Millions of students don't have the resources they need. Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security are under attack. All social services are under attack. And there is an extensive right-wing network trying to control everything. Something is definitely wrong here. In February of 2010, the entire staff of the Central Falls High School in Rhode Island was fired. The teachers in Central Falls have stated over and over that they were willing to sign on to the transformation model. It's because of our teachers that we have any reforms in place right now. And no, not threatening people, but working collaboratively because that's the only way this thing gets settled. But our hearts are bleeding for this high school. We do not want more injury caused to the children of our school and to the professionals who work in it. The staff has also been involved in professional development. Many attended PSYOP training. We attended skillful teacher training presented by the Research for Better Teaching. Inclusion training. We did this so we could help our students succeed in classes. We did this not because we were told to, but we knew that effective professional training was necessary to help our students succeed. To continue, we have been BEP'd, hunterized, sizerized, and we embraced America's choice, focused on a new, re new standard reference exams, worked with the Skills Commission, and have been kneecapped. The one constant for our students has been the teachers. This is not an excuse, and you may not want to hear it, but over the last five years, we have gone, oh, gone through over 20 different administrators, five different schedules. 
four years ago, I was appointed to a book selection committee for the American Library Association. Only 12 people in the country are invited to participate. My work during those three years on that committee has resulted in $24,000 worth of books in the high school. I am currently on a different book selection committee for which while I will receive approximately $18,000 worth of books. I do this work for the students. The total value is $399,000. And yet I am terminated along with all of my colleagues. When you make the decision to do a mass firing, you lose all of the resources of the many teachers. Justify that. I am proud to be a teacher at Central Falls High School. Good evening. My name is Teresa Gonia, and I'm a product of Central Falls High School. And I, <laughs> and now I say that without hesitation because I was lucky enough to go to Central Falls High School for my whole life. And I'm not sure if I had the opportunity if I would have gone anywhere else. You see, these teachers, they mean a lot to us and sure, you don't, all you've heard is what's in the media, but I encourage every single one of you to spend a day with these teachers and really see what I have learned from them. Because, <laughs> these teachers, they don't only teach us, but they learn from us as well. These teachers are so open-minded that I sat after school one day with one of my professors and she asked me for help on something. And at first I was kind of flabbergasted. I was like, whoa, whoa, I'm not really understanding this. But I understand that she was so open that she is willing to learn from us. And I, I can assure you more than 50% of the staff is willing to sit there and learn from us. These teachers could easily go teach in a school where they would get accredited and be told they're such a great teacher, but instead they stick to Central Falls despite the negativity and despite all these harsh comments because they love the students and they love where they are. I fully believe that these teachers don't need to go anywhere else. In 2008, I'm sorry, 2009, we lost one faculty member. His name was Michael Ochi, a 19-year English teacher, a mentor, and more importantly, my friend. It was really hard to just see that one teacher leave, and I'm not sure if I could handle losing 50% of this staff. I'm not sure the other alumni could, and I'm not sure these students could either. I want you to know that I graduated in 2009. I was in honors classes, but that doesn't really matter to me because the teachers, they made it so much more, and they made it interesting. And not only did they help me academically, but they helped me in every aspect of my life. I lost my father junior year to cancer, and these teachers, they took me under their wing. They stayed with me day in and day out after school, and they were willing to work with me to get, to keep my grades up and to keep me to continuing to understand that education is important. And I can tell you that I'm not sure I would have been where I am today without them. I'm currently a freshman at Roger Williams University. I'm on the Dean's List, I have a three points. <laughs> I'm on the Dean's List. I have a 3.65 GPO out of a 4.0. I'm a high school mentor at Pais in Providence. And I'm proud to say I wouldn't be there without the help that I had from these teachers. Commissioner Gist, when you visited the school, I looked you in the eye in the library and I said the teachers do not appear to be the problem. I want you to know I'm sticking to that statement. Thank you. And if the Central Falls teachers have raised the, at least the ELA test scores by 21% in the past two years. As someone who came into education from the business world, I cannot fathom any business or any other industry that would terminate an employee for 21% production increase. <laughs> There's a belief that with this approach, reconstitution or turnaround, it will actually encourage uh, more dedicated or better qualified teachers to come to a district or to a school. In fact, the research does not show this to be true. It'll be very difficult if this model is actually implemented in Central Falls. It'll be very difficult to attract 
dedicated, well-qualified staff to Central Falls. And in fact, in <coughs> districts where this has been attempted, the district, the school, has been thrown into chaos. And I just wanted to read to you one of the comments uh, from one of these earlier studies that captures what actually takes place. The comment is, lots of dedicated professionals who knew the curriculum and the students and had their classroom management strategies intact left because they would not succumb to the insult. They would not tolerate the disrespect, the mistreatment. We lost some wonderful, experienced teachers. We lost some real jewels. Now, when we look at everything that's happened in Central Falls already, the developments that have taken place, one thing is clear, this model is incredibly divisive. It's divided our community. We have a room filled with people who care about children in the state of Rhode Island, on the stage and sitting in the audience here. And I think that if we are actually to make any progress in solving what is a very complicated problem, collaboration is really the key and that's been the theme so far. And finally, I am pleased that Dr. Gallo wants to return to negotiations. And I look forward to formalizing her public comment of retaining 100% of the high school faculty. Thank you. Art teacher, 
you know, as, uh, Illinois is just as broke as, you know, most Midwestern states right now. And if, uh, if Illinois passes this bill as well, you, I'm not going to have any labor rights as an art teacher. My name's Jim Savage. I'm the president of the United Steelworkers Local 10-1 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Vice President Philadelphia AFL CIO, and it is once again my pride and my deep privilege to bring you greetings of solidarity from the 150,000 members of the Philadelphia AFL CIO. Thousand of those members gathered at City Hall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania today and rallied in support of all of you. Yeah. Fox News says it was 200. <laughs> Fox Lies, right? I don't feel like a guest to your fight. This is our fight. This is everybody's fight. We know that. Hi, this is Scott Walker. Scott, David Koch. How are hey, you? Hey, David. I'm good. And yourself? I'm very well. I'm a little disheartened by the situation there, but uh, what's the latest? Uh, we're actually hanging pretty tough. I mean, you know, this, uh, amazingly, there's a much smaller group of protesters, almost all of whom are in from other states today. What we were thinking about the crowds was uh, was planting some troublemakers. You know, the well, the, the only problem with the because we thought about that. The crowds just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. education teacher and I teach early childhood special education so I teach three four and five year olds with disabilities some of the you know most vulnerable kids in the school systems why is there tens of thousands of people out here demonstrating today because our governor is trying to ram this bill through with out listening to the public and it takes away collective bargaining rights for teachers and union workers throughout Wisconsin. Um, pretty much anyone in a union except he excluded the cops and the firefighters. They'll come later I guess. Um, but the bill also has a lot of nasty other nasty provisions. It has language in the bill that gives the governor the right to do anything he wants with Medicaid which is particularly frightening for me because a lot of the kids I teach are on Medicaid. They have fragile health care issues, they're children with autism, and they depend on Badger Care, which is Medicaid for kids in Wisconsin. And I'm afraid that's going to be gone, and these, these kids that I teach that really need it won't have any health care. So there's a lot of other nasty things in this bill, too. Um, it's a lot to uh, fight against. What I heard that he was trying to pay back his billionaire political sugar daddies by opposing these out-of-staters, radical, right-wing, un-Wisconsinite, un-American, illegal agenda on the backs of teachers, first responders, hard-working union members all over the state. I took it personally. In Walker's first three weeks of office, he gave $140 million away to corporates, out-of-state corporations, and that's at the heart of the budget issue. Um, doesn't have anything to do with balancing the budget. It has to do with breaking unions and breaking um, the workers in Wisconsin so that the corporations can have more profit, have more control. Unions are, you know, the only thing fighting back in these elections against the corporate money. 
And so it's about breaking them so that they can control elections. When he puts the interests of these guys who fired hundreds of employees last year and gave themselves an $11 billion bonus. When the governor then perversely targets the rights of teachers. Teachers! On December 15, 2010, the Boston School Committee voted to close 11 schools and merge 10 others. This is not just a story about Boston, it's a story about what's happening all across the nation. This documentary features excerpts from over 16 hours of testimony from four hearings that took place in December 2010 at English High School in Boston. Hundreds of people spoke with knowledge, concern, and passion. surrounded by an array of resources at its fingertips. Our students are determined to succeed. Give them the support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A week from tonight, you will cast your vote to close our neighborhood-based school in the heart of an underserved Roxbury neighborhood or make a morally, academically sound, common sense decision to keep the Emerson School open. When I go to school every day, like, I feel proud going to that school. Um, today I want to talk about the letter that you guys sent home and it says that um, after many interventions and after supporting our school so many times we're still underperforming and failing and I just want to know where is the support, what, in, what, what are the exact interventions that you guys made because we're working with broken computers, broken books, we're, hold on, hold on. we're, um, we're missing tables, um, broken doors, broken bookshelves, I don't know, whatever you can think of. As simple as markers that are not even working, you know. So I'm, I'm wondering where is exact is the support. Our schools is a multi-generational schools. We have teachers who have taught parents and their students. We have people who, who work there, who've gone to school there. So this is a school that has strong ties to the communities, multi-generational, and who serve children who other schools don't want to serve. We serve those kids. We embrace them. We 
do amazing things with that. Look at our academic record. And we do the growth that we have shown in the past two years. Our ELL students, why would you close something that is working so well? We have no empty seats at the Agassiz. I don't understand why would you close something that is working. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Closure of the Agassiz will disproportionately impact Hispanic, limited English proficient, and special needs students. School, right. school officials fail to mention that the school serves many poor families. Beam is concerned about the ongoing issues of equity and the disparate impact raised by the proposed school closings. Additional school closings are proposed for Roxbury and Dorchester further diminishing the opportunity for students and families seconds. to attend high quality schools in their communities and damaging the relationships that schools have built with their communities. We have a list of schools right now whereby 70% of these schools are black slash Hispanic, which is affecting us from a huge standpoint. You are making an irrevocable mistake here tonight if you vote to close schools. You are closing schools that work. You are disappointing students, you are frustrating parents, and you are hurting morale in our buildings. And you will have done it without having gone through the deliberate process that is required of a decision of this importance. You are closing schools that work to send schools, to send students to schools that are not necessarily any better. If the object of this reshuffling of thousands of students and staff is to improve education, you have failed miserably. <laughs> Adding insult to injury, the disruption will drive people away from our schools and towards charter schools, although I am not sure that honestly bothers you. On December 2, 2010, 13 days before the school closings vote, the executive director of the Mass Charter and Public School Association, Mark Keenan, sent an email hailing a real estate relationship to rent the closed schools as a tremendous breakthrough. Dear Charter Friends, In an unprecedented meeting yesterday, Boston Charter school leaders met with Boston Superintendent Carol Johnson, her staff, and high-ranking members of the Menino administration. The topic of discussion was a possible compact of collaboration between Boston Charters and BPS addressing the question, are there ways to work together that would improve the education of all Boston students? Keenan goes on to say in his email, in a related story, The Globe reported this morning that Mayor Menino and Superintendent Johnson announced yesterday the possibility of the city leasing empty, or soon to be empty, BPS buildings to Boston Charter Schools. This is being discussed in the city in relationship to the move by the district to close a number of BPS schools and reorganize, consolidate, move others. Such a real estate relationship would obviously be a tremendous breakthrough for charters. We're not going to give up on our schools and you shouldn't either. The answer to saving money is not to close schools that work. That's counterproductive. We should be here rejoicing in our success, in particular the success of these schools. Over the last four or five weeks, we have heard about programs that work and students who enjoy going to school, about small schools that have a good track record, a caring atmosphere, and supportive communities, and about large schools that have begun the turnaround process and have made progress. Your, mes your message ought to be, your progress is just what we are looking for, we'll keep you open. Your message ought not to be, we don't care about your progress, we are shutting you down. On, be on behalf of 6,500 members, I ask you to stay, take a step back, take this ill-conceived plan off the table, invite all stakeholders, staff, parents, and students together and work with us to keep the strong program well. Thank you, Mr. Scott. We'd rather close down a successful hub of learning for ELLs at the Agassiz and replace it with a charter school that serves the exact same population with no proven track record. We find that to be a slap in the face of public education. In August of 2010, 
Three and a half months before the school closing vote, the Fordham Institute, a big supporter of charter schools, put out a report entitled America's Best and Worst Cities for School Reform, subtitled Attracting Entrepreneurs and Change Agents. Cities were rated for how reform friendly they were. They tried to answer the question, which American cities are the most hospitable to education reform, especially the entrepreneurial kind? Boston received a C grade, 15th of 26 cities. In this case, a C grade is good. That means Boston has plenty of fight left to stop its privatization of its schools. According to the Fordham report, though, things are not looking so good in Memphis since 2007 when Dr. Johnson left Memphis for Boston. Charter schools are draining millions of dollars away from Boston schools. By 2017, Boston is expected to lose as much as $170 million per year under the legislation which was, will allow 18% of a district's budget to go toward charters. In this country, we teach leave no child behind. But what happened over two years ago when the Match Charter School siphoned out a few of its graduating seniors before graduation because they were falling behind? Those students would have injured their reputation. Dr. Johnson remembers this because she spoke up against this injustice to the Boston Globe. Statistics have shown that charter schools do not educate or provide services for special ed, they allow for average students. They cancel out those who are not making progress either academically, socially, or emotionally. Charter schools are leaving children behind. It is a shame that the superintendent's office isn't working to foster a long-term relationship with its own public school teachers. I please beg you to not close the agency. Your role is to advocate for our children. Your role is to assure access to a quality education for each and every one of them. You have abdicated your role and your responsibilities, and you should not labor under the delusion that because you're appointed by the mayor, you are not accountable to us. There has never been enough money for the Boston Public Schools since I was in kindergarten in 1958. That's an old story. Your task is to find the money, and then, Stop blaming the parents and the children who live with the albatross of poverty seconds. around their neck each day. Stop blaming the teachers who do the hard work every day. Stop colluding with the charter school operators. Stop appeasing the business interest and the Globe's editorial board. Do the right thing. Stand up for our kids. Thank you. Thank you. If, in the essence, Agassiz was given resources for two years in a row prior to the turnaround status that was designated by the state to make significant improvements. It's you're covering yourself up, that's all. Because y'all don't care about the kids, sir. and y'all don't care about the people. And my, my kids' school is excellent, excellent. My kids in the fifth grade advanced class. My daughter's on the same path. Come on. And just out the blue. My school just, my, my school, my kids' school was just notified like two days ago about the closure. What do you think of this? you think it's really MPCs or is it mismanaged? No, I think they just looking, they just targeting the schools that's in the black community. That's what I think, in the black community. You don't hear nothing else about Fall River, Whitman, and, and every other, uh, come on, let's focus. focus. They don't focus on the kids. They don't care about the kids. But their kids are in private school, their kids have long tuitions, their kids have everything set for them, for college and all that. Point like, blank period. Like he said, they have it all. Like they have said, it all. Why are all our schools being closed down? We are, they're already low budgeted schools. 
They can't get into private schools. They can barely get into charter schools. But you want to close these low budget schools? Basically, oh, they're putting too many millions into our low budget schools. But all these charter academic schools they want to pay all this money to? It's not fair. But this, why do you think they are closing the schools or asking to reduce the number of schools? Oh, because they're putting too much money into it. The kids are not learning enough. Okay, so they're not learning enough to even take off their mouth? So now you're ripping the education from underneath the kids' feet? Okay, y'all don't care where they go. Y'all don't care how they can attach to this school. It's just not fair. It's not fair. What's your name, ma'am? Shanika Walker. I live in Boston. The Farragut School is right outside my window. I've seen generation of kids go to that school, flourish, go to high school, go to college, and be great academic successes from the ground up. You know, you put money into the schools that you say are doing well. Well, give the kids an opportunity to do well. Don't take the little opportunities they have away from them. So they say that the reason they're doing it is because they're underperforming. Do you think there's another reason though behind this? Their minds is made up. I period. do. I exactly. feel like they rather the community at a stagnant level. Um, it's sad to say, but I feel like it, it's all about stagnation. If the community's not doing well and flourishing, then we're on to the next. Yep. Cambridge is doing well. Uh, Newton's doing well. Brookline's well, top really, tier. Yeah. You know, but Boston, Roxbury, Dorchester. No excuse. Why are there no resources for our inner city youth? Go to Newton, they've got tap, dance, piano, violin. I don't see any of these kids with violins, let alone school books. I think they need to just worry about improving the city versus getting rid of the Because I don't think that's going to solve No, get it. We have the capacity to instruct 63,000 students. We're currently instructing. 56,000 students. And I think that if you close the schools, that means there's going to be more overcrowding in the classroom because you're not opening new schools and, you know, new developments. You're just putting them to a new location. And I don't think that that's going to solve any issue at all. Now I have even more conviction to go ahead and take her off from Boston Public Schools. I just don't trust it any longer. After this evening, it's a joke. Everybody, we all gotta fight for our rights and we're gonna keep doing that after this vote, right? Yeah, yeah you hear me now? You listening? I hope you're listening. And I'm making sure that everybody, after today, we're gonna change. You know why? Because we all got a dream to fight for what's right, all right? So we're gonna fight for what's right, right? Can I ask? Save our schools, I saw what? We must stop balancing the books of city government on the backs of the Boston Public Schools and its children. Thank you very much for urging you to vote. I'm urging you to vote no on the proposal. This is not reinvesting, it's disinvestment. Thank you very much. On December 14th, one day before the school closing vote, Boston Mayor Tom Menino spoke at the Boston Chamber of Commerce. Mayor Menino called for the Boston School Committee to vote for the school closings and reminded them they were appointed. December 16th, the day after the school closing vote, Boston Mayor Menino stated, I wish the parents were the ones who spoke. For the most part, there were outsiders there trying to make some issues. Once again, my school, the Agassiz, is enduring difficult times. I am proud to be an English as a second language teacher at the Agassiz right here in Jamaica Plain. Unknown to my colleagues, I am going to share with you my personal story. My hope is to give you, the school committee, a glimpse into the personal side of the Agassiz family. On February 14th of this year, my own family suffered a tragedy. I awoke on that Sunday morning to a banging at my door. A police officer was banging and shining a flashlight into our home. I was half asleep with no idea what the noise was. Had Johnny gotten locked out? Since our three-year-old son was upstairs sleeping and I was three months pregnant, I first checked the couch to wake John up so he could go to the door. I called for him. He was not there. I was so confused. At 5 a.m., why wasn't he home from his night job? As I opened the door, I saw our car was not there either. The police officer had my name and address. She was not at the wrong home. She told me I needed to call South Shore Hospital immediately. I knew this couldn't be good. I could not make that call. So I handed her my phone and she called for me. 
They informed her that Johnny had died in a car accident. In a quick moment, at our young age, our whole life had changed. I became a widow and a single mom. At that moment, I cried for myself and my children. That was the first weekend of February vacation. After five days of bereavement, I returned to work. I needed to be back doing what I love with my work family. My son and I needed the routine. You're still wondering why I share the story with you. I tell you this because my Agassiz family went above and beyond. The children, the teachers, and the administration were all there for us. From the cards, the edible arrangement, the flowers, the donations, the cards for my son and for myself, to the most recent Christmas tree and even the Target gift card. They have supported us in every way. They even covered my bus duty so I could pick up Jace at the same time Daddy always had. On my return, the first student that welcomed me back was a child who had lost his dad six months prior. He came up to me and asked me if I had a yoga neck move for his sore neck. You see, in September I did 10 minutes of yoga a day with his class at our morning meeting. This wasn't a coincidence that he was the first child to talk to me on my return. This was to let me know my children would be okay one day. The Agassiz is full of children and adults that have overcome difficult times and have been there for each other. Life is not always easy as we all know. However, when you have such an incredible, caring, and smart group of people supporting you, you can do anything. Please keep our Agassiz family together. Vote no on closing the Agassiz Elementary School. We're gonna ask Mr. No We're gonna ask no Yeah, okay. We're gonna ask Miss Lumley to now call the roll. No Miss Miss Lumley is Miss Lumley. Thank you, Reverend Gruber. Mr. Barrows? Yes. No Mr. Harris? Yes. Mr. Harris? Yes. Miss Harris? Yes. Mr. Martinez? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. 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 Can you, can you announce uh, the, the the count? Seven votes in favor. Seven votes in favor. And they took away the vote for the people of Boston to vote for a school committee. And the mayor was to appoint a school committee. And everything changed. This is just the beginning. These are tough economic times. We have a number of enormous hurdles and colossal size issues and matters that we will need to address in the future, in the next several months ahead. Let me get this straight. Boston is closing 11 schools and merging 10 others. Education communities are being destroyed. Class size is going up dramatically to fill empty seats. Boston is losing 64 million this year and 120 million next year to charter schools. And the school department and the Menino administration met with the charter school people to discuss renting Boston school buildings. Many charter schools have millions of dollars in the bank, mostly from corporate donations. The mayor of Boston spoke at the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce the night before the school closing vote and failed to ask the attending millionaires for the $10 million to prevent the school closings. Boston loses $344 million every year because educational institutions and medical institutions are exempt from property taxes due to an 1830s law. The Fordham Institute Big Charter School supporter put out a report rating the entrepreneurial opportunities for charterizing and privatizing the schools in Boston and 25 other cities. School closings, budget cuts, and teacher firings will continue. The chairperson of the Boston School Committee, Reverend Groover, says this is just the beginning. And it's happening all over the country.
Mayor Menino declined to be interviewed for this movie. Reverend Groover, BPS School Committee Chairperson, initially agreed to be interviewed. Then just before the interview was to begin, Reverend Groover came back to his office and stated that Superintendent Johnson told him not to do the interview. Shortly after that, we received this email. Mr. Lamoth, thank you for your interest in an interview with both Reverend Groover and Superintendent Johnson. As you can imagine, both of their schedules are very full, which means they cannot accommodate all interview requests. At this time, on behalf of Reverend Groover and Dr. Johnson, we are going to pass on your offer to be interviewed. Should you have any questions, please feel free to contact me directly. Best, Matt Wilder, Director of Media Relations, Boston Public Schools. As we were leaving, a shadowy figure came out of the building and took our picture. We're still waiting for an answer from Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick. There is a whole other um, arena where uh, th that they need to learn about, that they need to to see that there there are artists that have, there his history through throughout history that have created this wonderful um, you know uh, heritage for them. The arts are important because they are a manufacturing plant for ideas that are that are most important to us and most valued by us. Um, they're the ideas that keep us alive and civilized and keep us, that cause us to thrive. As you observe, observe how children learn, uh, like in any population, there's a certain very academic type of person. But most people need to experience things to really know it, to touch it, to feel it, to work through it. The process of learning uh, of acquiring understanding is um, usually has to take on more than just one element. I enjoyed it most when the kids would come in in the morning and a, a child would say to me, I wrote a book last night and they would show me their book and tell me what their book was about or they would say, wrote my numbers last night or they would take something that we had done at school and practice it at home, either with mom or by themselves, or they had taken a, a book home and they had read it to their dog last night, or um, I, especially, I especially loved it when something inspired them from school that they took home and they, and they took it that step further. I loved it when they made books, when they wrote books at home and they would bring them in to me and share them all excited because they knew I loved books. The arts are, um, are a vehicle for learning and uh, it, it allows the children, the students at whatever level, to become so confident, to believe in not only themselves but what they want to do in their future. It lets them dream of their substance and value in life. By allowing students to make art of life, their lives and values and dreams and aspirations also becomes the stuff of art. When a learner is equipped to exercise their right to evaluate their assets and their experience, offering their creative output to the world through acts of art making and design, the gap between their aimlessness and their enthusiastic agency quickly closes. Well, what I like is when kids' eyes finally open because most of the time they're just looking at things. But occasionally there will be this flash of insight and you can see a kid begin to see something rather than look at something. We've been lucky enough to, to have some, some very, very strong leadership that I think has been uh, interested in experimentation responsive to teacher ideas, uh, and, and, and interested in moving the school forward. Whatever the environment is, um, you could actually see it penetrate through the school, particular schools. Every teacher I've come in contact 
um, has been um, dedicated. They have a passion for teaching, um, which for me, it rubbed off on me even more. I think education should make a human being um, proud in the right way of themselves, who they are, and make them think what they can do really um, to make this world a better place. Especially that our students are not just there to buy a Porsche or, or become a very happy person with a nice uh, castle in front on the seashore, but that they really carry the burden of the future of humanity on their shoulders. Thank you.